Hello and welcome all of you out there in the cloud and thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Micah. I'm here with my teammates Hillary and John and we're part of Accenture's cloud first group. Uh, Accenture's $3 billion investment has made this past year uh, to, to help clients across all industries become cloud first businesses and accelerate their digital transformation. So today we're gonna to share with you our experience building a solution to deploy and support a Kubernetes application at scale on the edge and on any cloud. So John, you can go ahead and kick us off to the next slide. And I'll, I'll do some brief introductions of everybody here. So John is a director within Accenture's Google Cloud practice as well as uh, Cloud First, and as well as the global Anthos and Kubernetes lead for Cloud First. Um, over 25 years experience designing, delivering complex tech architecture, all the way from on-prem to multi-cloud. John is your guy if you need help with any of that. Hillary is a rock star software and platform engineer with, within Cloud First Design Group. So Cloud First Design is basically the tip of the sphere, spear for enterprise cloud transformations. So Hillary engages with big clients on big transformations. And uh, with that becomes comes often big, hairy problems. So Hillary's also a mentor with Girls Who Code, supporting gender inclusivity and in technology. So if we were in person, you all clap for that right now. But uh, lastly, I'm Micah, and I also am in Cloud First Design uh, group along with Hillary where I architect solutions and lead engineering teams in transformational projects, as well as Greenfield work. And on the outside of work, I, I like to mentor young men, uh, especially those who are breaking into technology from non-traditional backgrounds like myself. Uh, let's go to the agenda, John. All right, so today we are going to state and share with you our problem that we had uh, to solve, and then the method that we sort of took and the maturity model that we used to come up, up with our eventual architecture and solution. And then we'll share with you a few lessons learned as well. So pretty basic approach. And uh, yeah, let's, let's kick it off. So I'm going to start by introducing to you our client. So our client provides solutions for the life sciences. And, and remember, we're, we're a consulting company, right? So we have we have clients and we have customers. I'll, I'll try and make sure I make the distinction for you all today. Uh, but our client provides solutions for the life sciences by provisioning scientific instrumentation for their customers. Picture scientific labs, right? So they have a new services layer data platform that is going to connect their scientific machines to their network. Uh, you can think of it like a common services layer. And what we were tasked to do is to build an installer that would then deploy uh, that application to their internal network. So a lot of our clients' customers insist on self-hosting for data privacy, privacy reasons, which may mean that they host in the cloud or some host on-premise. And some of the smaller customers are even ordering an entire bare metal machine from our client with the required packages preloaded onto the machine for them to then self-install with our solution. But our client ultimately wanted to provide, we, we identified these, these sort of main five things. Uh, number one is excellent service and support to their customers. Might go without saying, um, but this kind of was a basis that, that we kept coming back to. But that would also mean practicing operational excellence. So robust and resiliency. Uh, resiliency was among probably one of the top of the most needed illities in this solution. The solution also needs to be extensible to a variety of needs and environments. So with different IT departments uh, from their customers, that would mean each having you know, their own rules as the customer base scales, so does the variety of the needs. But what's nice about the solution is that it's supporting a relatively new application that was written in Kubernetes. And so it makes it easy for us to deploy anywhere. Um, when it came to cost efficiency, that was something that our client wanted to obviously save themselves, but also their customer money. So that was important. And lastly, a solution that's relatively future proof. So that would last for years to come. Like I said, the underlying app itself is, is brand new, right? And so they wanted the, uh, the solution that would be installing it to support that as well. Um, we can go to the next slide. 
All right. So meet Albert. Okay. Albert is our representative end user. He is a scientist in a lab with or without lab coat, depending on his exact setup among different customers. So Albert comes with a few constraints. Number one, his data is top secret. Um, so John, you can show that next portion. Um, I've broken this down a little bit for you. So uh, you're gonna have to click extra, make you work a little harder. So his his data is, is top secret, it's classified, right? That means um, we need to handle it very securely, very carefully. So we saw for this in a couple of ways. First of all, we have a self-hosted infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned already, we're enabling Albert to host this within his own infrastructure to alleviate his concern of his data being merged with or seen by any competitor, for example. Um, being his own infrastructure, we also needed to provide a way for him to supply his environment credentials in a safe and secure manner. So credential management was also an important part of our solution. Second, as you can see, Albert is not great with computers. So uh, we solve for this by providing both a managed support model, uh, as well as creating a custom user-friendly UI. So a proprietary app that we built for our client where, where the customer, where Albert doesn't need to interact with any cloud consoles or run any cube cuddle commands. Um, but all that is abstracted by the front end. So uh, last third thing is that Albert's IT guys will not let anyone access their environment. So he's just following directions, but the, the big bad IT group says no go. Uh, so we did a few things here. We, we had to look for a way to run the app installation locally. So we, Hillary will tell you later on about the, the local pipeline that we built for that. Then also this required flexibility is important as the installer needs to be configurable, flexible enough to meet, again, like I said, a variety of different IT group requirements. So um, if this wasn't all complex enough, John, you can go to the next slide. We have a lot of Alberts. So add to this the complexity that we have to serve what our, inclined, what our client would anticipate is to be hundreds, even thousands of customers. Um, one more click for me, John. So that means we have to support, of course, a even larger variety of clouds and environments and scaling to this many users made it really important that we would reduce that margin for error. And so making it as low touch and highly automated as possible was key. And lastly, in order for technical support staff to support so many customers, it was really important that we found a way to provide what essentially ended up being a, a single pane of glass into the operation of their Kubernetes clusters. This was huge and really exciting part of our overall solution, both to us and, and our client, uh, as they're going to be you know, in good hands for, for years to come. But I will um, not spoil too much here. Uh, without uh, any further ado, let me pass this along to you, John. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, the next part of this presentation is the methodology, what we did. So our approach for the project was to leverage a cloud native solution by utilizing a Kubernetes platform that allowed for the environment ch uh, challenges of the project along with leveraging the best third-party tools in the industry and combining that with the industry best practices. This solution resulted in the recommended platform for the project. Over the last five years, I have been talking to clients about their journeys. There is journey to the cloud. <clears throat> There's also the DevSecOps journey, as well as the Kubernetes container journey. However, during the last six months, I have shifted this conversation. I have turned it on its head. Today, every client is multi-cloud. We all agree on that, I believe. And it is a combination of all these journeys. It's a combination of journey to the cloud, the DevSecOps journey, as well as the Kubernetes container journey. Today, the conversation is the cloud data journey. What does being cloud native really mean and why is it so important? 
what should you know to accelerate and optimize this transition towards being cloud native? Enterprises that migrate from an on-premise to a cloud native environment need to rethink their infrastructure requirements. When migrating to a cloud native environment, and the infrastructure becomes spread out among multiple IT environments, while applications are distributed to support the enterprise's digital transformation. As your IT infrastructure progressively moves to the cloud, it must ensure that the business agility approach aligns with the cloud native strategy. You will not only need to understand the business value of developing and deploying cloud native applications, but also how to deal with the strategic IT management challenges in the multi-cloud and hybrid cloud environments. In the most simplest terms, a cloud native strategy enables services to be used across applications and other services. It's about how applications are created and deployed, not whether they sit on public, private, or hybrid cloud. Cloud native applications are designed to scale horizontally rather than vertically. To scale these applications, that relies on technology and concepts such as agile, DevSecOps, multi-cloud, hybrid clouds, and microservices. When we look at enterprises' cloud native journeys, we find there are four technology enablers. The first one be Kubernetes. Kubernetes provides the means by which to automate the deployment, management, and or scaling of applications containers across infrastructure. Second is service mesh. A service mesh is a way to control how different parts of an application share data with one another. Third is serverless. Serverless computing allows you to run applications and services without the need of providing services. Fourth is a common control plane. A common control plane provides a consistent development and operation model experience across hybrid and multi-cloud environments. One DevSecOps pipeline and one place to manage all my clusters and policies. When I work with clients on getting them proficient and able to scale with a cloud native approach, I start with this five step scale. It should be no surprise that most clients today are at level of two. At level two, they have a standardized approach, set of tools for certain functions and started scanning their containers at build time and at rest. My goal is to get them to a level of four where they have a mature capability in place to support DevSecOps and are becoming skilled subject matter experts and have runtime scanning enabled at scale. And ultimately, they can scale to level five where they're doing really cool things like data ops and blueprint deployments. As stated, there are five stages within the cloud native maturity model. While you may be in stage two or five in one application, you may be at a different stage in a different application. Keep this in mind as you identify your stages of maturity. So let's break down these stages further. The first one is Zeta, level one. You have a baseline cloud native implementation in place and are in pre production. Level two, I'm repeatable. This means the cloud native foundation is enabled and you are moving to production. Third level is consistent. Your competency is growing and you're defining processes for scale. The fourth one is optimized. You're improving security policy and governance across your environment. And last, we have a level five leading. You are re revisiting decisions made earlier and monitoring applications infrastructure for optimization. Based on the cloud native maturity model, we have developed the Cartographics project. The aim is for organizations to start their cloud native journey with a real framework on how to adopt these new applications and platforms. The authors wanted to provide a cloud native framework for success. We want to educate and inform users 
with the effective and practical guidance to help them understand the cloud native ecosystem. We do this by collaborating with groups inside and outside of the CNCF. So please check out the links provided at your convenience. On the edge, when we looked at the needs for the client of this use case, we compared K8s and K3s. K3s offer small applications to run clusters and IoT devices. And that's great for running containers on the edge. However, for this client, we need the scalability and the ability to run workloads across multiple environments, while K3s can only host workloads running in a single cloud. K8 gives you the ability to scale an application based on the quality of incoming traffic and quantity. For this reason, mentioned Pride is why we chose K8s for our edge solution over K3s. The K8 platform chosen for this project was Google Anthos. With Google Anthos, we can perform it Kubernetes clusters, whether I'm running Amazon EKS, Microsoft AKS, Red Hat OpenShift, and so on, I'm able to combine all my clusters in one single pane of glass. And that, this also includes, by the way, if I'm running Raspberry Pi clusters or clusters on my own laptop. And I'm able to take all these different environments and, and place it in one particular platform called Anthos. And for the client, this was a home run for us. I will now hand the microphone over to Hillary. Awesome. Um, so as we discussed earlier, um, we are looking to deploy into a lot of different customers' environments. So based on their preferred environment, uh, we're looking to meet their self-hosted needs. Now, how do we do this? For this specific installation, as John had mentioned, we use Google Anthos. So Anthos helps by supporting a single flavor of Kubernetes across the cloud and on-premise environments. The single flavor of Kubernetes allows the application teams to have minimal considerations when deploying into the different environments and continue focusing on the application instead of programming for the changing environments, which definitely helps our platform team. Um, now, in the following slides, we are gonna break down the solution by discussing the following. How we brought DevSecOps processes locally, how a local Windows installer enabled a low-touch provisioning process. Additionally, we're going to discuss the tooling um, that supported the environment agnostic deployments. And finally, we're going to walk through the additional considerations that we had to look at when deploying um, the data platform on a bare metal solution. Next slide. Awesome. So how do we take these software best practices to our client's laptop. Next slide. Automated deployments into private clusters with focus on security is critical to having a mature Kubernetes deployment as John was talking about earlier. In the industry, it is fairly standard practice to run either a self-hosted DevOps agent within the virtual network to access the private cluster or to access the cluster through a Bastion host. Uh, the DevOps agent and a Bastion host both provide um, secure ways to connect to the cluster, but also help uh, provide a consistent environment, such as operating system, tools already installed in it, in order to have a consistent deployment into the cluster. This is key when considering that our deployments are going to be happening from a Windows computer that does not have any prerequisites installed on it. So the challenge was, is how do we provide a low touch customer experience, follow DevSecOps best practices and securely connect to private clusters, all while running it on a Windows computer. We achieve this by building a installer that deploys a orchestration VM, what we call an orchestration VM into the customer's network. Um, so this orchestration VM serves as a secure control plane for deployments to be consistently run regardless of and fully independent from the customer's computer. 
This virtual machine serves as a cross between a DevOps agent and a Bastion host, as we were discussing on the previous slide, um, and allows us to bring those DevSecOps processes locally to the customer's computer. Now, let's break down what's happening in this image. So starting at step one, the customer is gonna submit a form with specific inputs that the IT group can put in. So cider block ranges, um, additional configurations that we allow them to, uh, to customize in order to meet their IT group's needs. So these inputs uh, that they'll fill into a form feed our infrastructure as code scripts that will then be executed by the installer. So once the customer fills out this form with the IT group specifications, the form submission then triggers the build, beginning of the building of the environment. So everything that's on the right-hand side of the image. So clicking this execution order and kicking this all off is similar to kicking off a DevOps pipeline. It's then going to build out the virtual network, which will end up holding the remaining infrastructure, including the orchestration VM, which is where the rest of the scripts will run. So once the VM is up and running, all the build packages will be transferred from the installer, so locally on the customer's computer, to the virtual machine, similarly to build packages being provisioned onto a DevOps agent in a pipeline. So once all these prerequisites are met, infrastructure's code scripts are executed through the orchestration VM, not to hit the nail on the head again, but bringing the DevOps process locally, running just as you would be running a pipeline, but just controlling it all from your local Windows computer. So this remote DevOps process is mirrored across all the cloud environments to run the infrastructure's code script securely uh, in the various clouds and meeting the customer's needs and allowing the IT group to take their customizations, plug it into what's essentially a Google form, and then they walk away with a secure Kubernetes deployment that is running a data, data platform Login monitoring is already in place and all the operations are all connected back um, to, to Antho, through Anthos to um, GCP, which then allows the operations to be managed and handled externally from our user Albert, externally from his IT group. Everything is securely deployed but managed um, by our client. Next slide. All right, so what tools and considerations needed to take place in order to allow this data platform to be running in all these various environments? Next slide. Tool selection was critical for the success of this cross-cloud and cross-environment deployment. Um, by choosing the right tools and similar processes, it allowed us to port solutions between the clouds or at the very least near the steps. Here's a quick outline of some of the tools that we selected. Um, we are using Stackdriver or Google, the Google Operations Suite to build out the logging and monitoring in our various environments. This plugged in well with Anthos um, and the sort of monitoring and logging that it already provides. However, say in an environment such as a bare metal environment where the customer are choosing um, to deploy on a single server, have everything within their own virtual network, they already have fairly strict um, and considerations and requirements that their IT group has set forth. So a customer like this may not want their logs to be sent externally for security reasons just to meet their um, IT group's requirements. So that's where a Prometheus and a Loki may come into the mix, um, enabling the customers to um, allow a deployment that is acceptable to their IT group's requirements. So as alluded to earlier, um, Terraform is, was our primary uh, infrastructure's code um, tool in order to configure the various cloud environments. Uh, and again, all the cloud environments were run through that same similar process that mirrored each other. So as we were looking to build out an environment the cross environments and allow the configurations to be customizable to meet the IT group specification. Um, testing served as a critical pillar to rapidly validate the deployments. So later on, um, TerraTest was added in order to validate uh, the cloud environments prior to the execution of the installer. Um, so that ended up coming in super handy. All right, next slide.
All right, so um, bring this back to Albert again. Um, Albert and his IT group want everything securely and de securely deployed locally, but they don't want to be in charge of the operations. Albert has other things to be worrying about. He wants to be running um, machine learning processes in using the application, but he doesn't want to worry about the day-to-day -day of managing a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so in order to support customers like Albert, um, we built out a customer service model where all the clusters link back to um, the same GCP project. This allows a single team to manage the various deployments with a single painted class viewpoint, um, allowing the logging and monitoring and alerting configurations to be continue to be extended across all the clouds and providing a consistent uh, management experience for all the customers, regardless of their cloud or environment of their choosing. Um, right, next slide. Okay, so um, finishing this section up, just to talk a little bit about the bare metal use case and some of the decision points that we came across in order to build out this environment for our data platform. So Bare Metal Anthos um, provides the benefits of the cloud, um, bringing them into an on-premise environment, but it doesn't fully remove the challenges that need to be addressed when building out a bare metal solution. Um, so here are some of the decisions and trade-offs that we went through in order to support this data platform locally. Um, so networking is sort of the, one of the first decisions you kind of need to build out when uh, gathering your requirements for a bare metal environment. So uh, looking to understand whether or not you are going to be running a singular cluster or if you're going to be managing uh, more than one cluster that will need to be speaking to each other from different servers. So our specific use case, um, the customers are going to be running um, within a singular server, the platform's gonna be fairly isolated um, within itself. And so we did not need to build out a bridge network. Instead, we are able to, um, to use the configuration of a standalone cluster on the server and then have everything sort of encapsulated within itself and exposed um, on a load balancer. Um, so the next thing that is good to that we found um, was helpful to build out um, and get the requirements on for our cluster was the storage requirements. So understanding what are the persistent volume claim needs and how this plays into the sizes of the various nodes that you are going to be provisioning um, was crucial in order to build out and properly partition um, everything on the server. Um, so, our special, so our data platform has an additional use case of it has a lot of raw disk memory that is needed in order to run um, the platform. So we also needed to take into consideration the additional space that is needed to run NFS volumes um, and make sure that everything is securely and um, maturely partitioned so that the data platform can run without issues and continue to run without issues as um, more and more data gets gather, gathered and analyzed. Um, so that kind of like leads into the final point of um, which is crucial for your application teams to consider when building out this environment is how are we making sure that this single server is not a single point of failure and making sure that the disaster recovery um, tools and systems are in place in order to make sure that everything is all set. Um, so yes, everything's running on a single server, but it's also key to be backing up externally from this server. So say if something goes wrong, it's not gonna be a one domino takes down everything. Um, so yes, everything's running on one server, but also making sure that it's not um, exclusively the server that is dependent on everything that's running in this data platform for that specific customer. Um, so yeah, that's how we looked at the bare metal um, needs for customers like Albert and taking their IT groups considerations into, um, into our solution when bare metal. So I'm gonna toss it off um, to Micah 
to talk about lessons learned. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Good, thank you, Hillary. Um, yeah, so, you know, that we learned a lot on this project. Um, also had a blast. Um, it, it was, ultimately, it was a lot of fun learning about the product and the technology behind it for those of us, really all of us, I think, learned, you know, specifics about the technology. We were sort of solving for something that we hadn't seen done anywhere else in the industry quite like it. So, uh, number one, I'll just start with this, um, you know, in general, if we talk about tenants, what a tenant is, right, is, is it's a principle that, that really help us to come decision time, commit one way or another. And so that is, you know, when we come to a fork in the road and we're torn whether we should go right or left, we come back to our tenants to remember what's most important to us. Uh, and doing so is especially important when designing a system from scratch and on a short timeline uh, or really in any agile, fast-paced environment. So it was crucial to have these things uh, these tenants considered uh, or for considering trade-offs I should say as that really is like an everyday occurrence at that point when you're when you're starting from scratch so first of all number one is one of the most very first questions that you want to ask is to uh, ask what is most important to our customer so we can call this after we call this our, our ultimate tenant of tenants right what uh, Jeff Bezos and crew have popularized as customer obsession so as I mentioned before, for consultants, our client is our customer, but ultimately this really comes down to the end user of the product, what is most important to them. So keeping this in mind throughout the project was very helpful to anchor all parties. That's, you know, tech, business, product, but the whole team on, on what was most important. Second is that we were intentional about having a bias for action. Now on our project specifically, we had a fairly junior team, not a ton of experience directly within the team. And so... It was all the much, all the more important that we we tested our theories, uh, that we asked for advice from others outside of the team, uh, but also to be intentionally confident. So you know, junior or not, and I think these these tenets too, I'm, we're sharing because they're applicable not just to us, but hopefully to a lot of you and across different projects. Um, but you know, junior or not, it may at times be easy to second guess yourself, which isn't a bad thing in itself. But if you've already tested the theory and or ask for advice then to remember that you're here for a reason and so go forward with that you'll never be 100 percent sure about a, a decision or a technology trade-off you know that's it's pluses and minuses and so we have to at the end of the day make a call and go for it uh, and be confident with it and and then knowing that also you know it's okay to to fail or to to realize later that you want to pivot and make a, a different decision um, number three was that we were we realized to remain faithful to our definition of done. This was something that uh, really served us well from, um, excuse me, from considering least privilege each time that we rolled out a new uh, change to the infrastructure to, to uh, have to consider least privilege, just not that we would have it 100% tied up, but at least not leave this to be a snowball at the end that needed to be addressed. I think it saved us a lot of time. In addition to that, similarly, test-driven development, um, writing those tests early on and, and upfront, and um, and in the same and the same is automation and low touch. So, adding all of these to our definition of done from the outset was really helpful. Now, uh, that that just meant that you know any user story before we called it completely finished, we made sure that we had done these things, which also made sure we had allocated for them when it came time for sprint planning. I will say that we later and probably upfront we should have added documentation to this definition of done or i don't know i feel like even if it was there it was always hard to actually get done so that ended up being a bit of a sprint at the end um, which is is something that we want to get better at in the future and number four is there on the top is that big companies we we, we recognize have their perks and so i guess one of the decision uh, decisions that continued to serve us down the line throughout the project was upfront, we decided to use Google's Anthos product for our control plane, central control plane. Um, this, like I said, it really served us because we always had support. Um, there was continual product inter iterations occurring to Anthos. I mean, this was, you know, a, a, a big product for them. It's, it's only a, a couple of years in now for them. Um, and, and ultimately, right, it's, it's like an amalgamation of a number of other services that they have already. 
um, built for Kubernetes support, but the, the continual support given by the team that solved not just the needs that we were coming up with, but even looked around the corners and, and some unforeseen problems, which we hadn't considered, you know, when we did bring it up to the Google team, they were already considering it as well, such as one was, you know, deploying to a customer in China where laws and regulations were vastly different than uh, deploying here in the U.S. for us. So uh, this this just was, you know, some of the things that we learned and and wanted to highlight as as the lessons that we'll take forward to other projects as well. Uh, it doesn't mean that it has to be done this way, but you know, ultimately was was helpful. So. Um, that is it. I, we won't ask for questions because it's not live. So all we can really say at this point is thank you and uh, appreciate everyone's um, time here and, and uh, pretend participation. No. So um, thanks all from Accenture and from Hillary and John, myself, and um, have, have a good rest of your conference. Bye. Thank you.